pretty tepid or complete failure, I would say. Um, okay, I, I would submit um, that the UN has been extraordinarily and wildly successful. I think it's been it's one of the more successful investments that we as an international community have made. Uh, there's a wonderful uh, website which I struggled mightily to download the graphics from to show it to you tonight. So just trust me or go and check it out yourself called ourworldindata.com. Ourworldindata or data.com. And they're a, a sort of a, a, a collection site for some of the most credible research on all kinds of issues around the world, including peace and justice, or peace and human rights, I think they call it. So when you go to the peace and human rights section, you can see all this data presented in very easy to, to digest ways. And it reflects what all the major researchers in uh, war and peace studies will tell you about the trend lines in violence uh, in, as a result of violent conflict, which is that since the end of the Second World War, when the UN was established and other major multilateral institutions came to be, like the European Union, the Organization, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, <coughs> eventually the African Union, that since that time, specifically since 1946, the number of people who have been killed as a result of violent conflict has been dropping very steadily, almost completely steadily, and quite precipitously since then until today, uh, with a slight increase in the last few years. Um, I don't mean to minimize the tremendous and unacceptable suffering that we have going on today, but I think as we all get very depressed about what's going on in the world, and I give a lot of these talks, and nine times out of ten people feel, if you'll excuse my French, that the world is going to hell. And there are many things that are disturbing, but if you actually look at the investments that have been made, if they were made in order to prevent war, they've been tremendously successful, particularly at preventing and bringing an end to interstate war. It still happens. Uh, but but it's, it's reduced greatly from 1946 until today. So why do we feel it's been such a failure, right? So I think one reason that we might feel it's a failure is today, uh, much more than in the 1940s, we see uh, with our own eyes through our phones, if nothing else, every second, the news of what's going on in the world. And the news tends to show us particularly the most vile things that are happening and the most troubling things that are happening. Uh, that's part of the picture, I think. I think another part of the explanation is that those of us sitting here in the United States and in other very developed countries, traditionally more stable countries since World War II, are feeling a kind of vulnerability that we haven't really felt since World War II. And even some people didn't feel as much in World War II as today. Um, uh, is it justified or not? There's a lot of research showing that if you ask the average American or Western European the likelihood that they would be harmed or killed in a terrorist attack, uh, they're their prognosis, their assumption of what the likelihood would be is wildly outweighs the reality of uh, what's the likelihood that they would be caught up in a terrorist attack. Uh, but as we know, and I'll come back to this later tonight, what people feel is a much more powerful predictor of what uh, of their attitudes and their beliefs than uh, fact or truth is. Which is not to say that facts are not important, particularly in today's world. I think we have to say facts are, are really important. But unfortunately, facts are much less effective than feelings in altering people's attitudes and behaviors. And so people today feel very vulnerable. So those might be two of the reasons that we think we've been such a failure uh, at reducing violent conflict. There is a third, which we have to acknowledge, which is as successful as the institutions have been, they are all struggling mightily, mightily with modern manifestations of conflict. While the prospect of interstate conflict has reduced substantially, it certainly hasn't gone away, the fragility of states and intrastate conflict, weak and failed states, civil wars breaking out as a, as a result, uh, or the kinds of threats to stability that transcend borders, uh, the threats that come as a result of the effects of climate change, uh, the threats that come as a result of stateless extremist movements, these things are very difficult for state actors alone to deal with. Um, in fact, we had a, one of my colleagues had a meeting with the National Security Advisor of one of the most populous countries in the world, who said to him, behind closed doors, I'm a military man, and when there is an attack in this region, it's a region of this country where there have been regular uh, terrorist attacks uh, from a particular movement, um, I, I, I know what I can do. I have one button to push. I can send in the military, and I know that's going to bring us short-term stability. I also know it's going to create longer term problems, and I need some more buttons to push. And that conversation is, you can sort of uh, multiply that to every government, uh, even multinational corporations that are trying to secure their 40 year investment in a gold mine or a pipeline 
um, uh, really struggling with how you deal with modern manifestations of conflict, which are certainly not just state to state, but now they involve a super empowered population. Um, now, the positive side of this, uh, we oftentimes think about these, this, this new development in peace and conflict as a whole new set of threats, right? But there also is a whole new set of tools and techniques for reducing those threats and for stabilizing societies. And that's really where our organization and a growing proliferation of organizations and citizens like peace builders sit. Um, in fact, our business, you could say, is to create a lot more of those buttons to push for government leaders and civil society leaders alike. Um, to, 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 to push. Um, when we were established in 1982, the Search for Common Ground was established in 1982, peace building was really seen as the remit of governments working through their diplomats. Uh, or once in a lifetime, transcendent figures and movement leaders like Mandela or Martin Luther King or Gandhi. Um, the role of non-governmental organizations or organized citizens in peace building was really not taken all that seriously. Um, that's changed a great deal today. Uh, we were one of the first organizations that began working in this space and receiving support from the Norwegians and the Dutch and the Swedes and eventually the Americans and the British, some of the very players who helped establish the United Nations system, right? Um, uh, but now there's a proliferation. We have many peers doing excellent work in our field, dedicated peace building organizations, and also most, if not all, really of the major development agencies and humanitarian organizations have now developed a real expertise and practice in conflict resolution and peace building because they understand it to be absolutely mission critical to any other achievement that they want to try to accomplish. So I want to talk a little bit about how it is that we can and actually are unleashing that power of citizen-led peace building. Uh, and there are two sort of conceptions that are helpful for us to always remind ourselves as a basis for doing that. The first is that conflict uh, is not a good or a bad thing in itself. Conflict is completely natural. Uh, violence, I would say, is not. And uh, conflict for us at Search for Common Ground uh, is the natural existence of difference and the nat natural clashes of those differences in any diverse society, any diverse community. Um, the key question really is how you deal with those conflicts. Um, and I point this out for a couple of reasons. First, we've become preoccupied with the notion that war is inevitable. Um, and yet, we know that all wars end. I mean, the same data that we would use to say war is inevitable would lead us to understand that wars always end. Um, uh, in my own lifetime, we've seen the end of wars and conflicts that people had assumed were completely intractable and would go on forever. Apartheid South, South Africa, the troubles in Northern Ireland, uh, more recently the Colombian peace process, even more recently than that, uh, you know, ETA, the separatist, Basque separatist movement in Spain laying down their weapons and initiating the peace process the ends of wars in Sierra Leone and Liberia and Sri Lanka, and you have to go on and on and on. And most of these are not completed processes. Some of them are quite precarious. Some of them, though, are quite stable. Uh, and so wars are constantly ending, even though we focus very much on the ones that are beginning. And so it's, it's helpful to remember that when we think about just how inevitable is this violence and how possible is a more peaceful world. But the more profound reason that I point out this is that violence is natural, but violence is not. Uh, is, is really has nothing to do with violence at all. It's a recognition that in order to solve uh, any of our complex problems today, in order to advance any of the causes, if, even if you're not particularly, if you don't see yourself necessarily as a peace builder, but you really care about climate, or you really care about nuclear nonproliferation, or you really care about you know, any of the major disease eradication, poverty eradication, any important, uh, really truly important cause today, um, all of, those, all of those causes are only going to be addressed if we're able to initiate and sustain an unprecedented level of cooperation across public and private sector, across nations, across cultures. That's critically important because the world now is undeniably interconnected and interdependent. We used to say the world is interconnected and interdependent in my field, and it was sort of seen by many people as sort of a nice philosophy that was a statement of values. It's now a statement of reality. It's reflected in that National Security Advisor statement and the statements of more and more government leaders and corporate leaders that how do I deal with the reality of interdependence now, where I cannot win if somebody else loses. And if somebody loses hard and often enough, it's really going to blow back on me. And that kind of interdependence is very difficult for institutions, communities, leaders to deal with. 
And so it's important to understand not just conflict resolution and conflict transformation as a way to end violence, but actually much more important, it is actually the key to unlocking progress on all the other major barriers and challenges before us. In fact, if you um, caught Mark Zuckerberg's letter to the Facebook community that he wrote in February, this 5,700 word letter that Zuckerberg wrote, it was quite a profound statement. And, and he's been attacked for it, and he's been celebrated for it, and they're still figuring out on Facebook what are they going to do about it. And uh, it was largely sparked by a reflection um, highlighted by the 2016 elections in this country, and more than that, how the, how the campaigns played out. Uh, that um, what effect are we actually having if all we focus on is connecting people to one another and serving their, their interests and their appetites? Um, are we creating bubbles of people who only choose to connect with people who think like that, who only choose sources of information that reinforce the existing worldviews. Right? If we do that, aren't we creating just more rigidity and extremism within those bubbles and less understanding between them? You know? uh, and so he wrote this letter in which he basically restated Facebook's mission, that Facebook has to move, he said, from simply connecting the world to creating certain kinds of community. What kinds of community? He said they have to be safer, more inclusive, more civically engaged, more supportive and more informed. Well, the way to do that has been, frankly, really at the core of the international and domestic conflict transformation <coughs> community's efforts from the very beginning. And so we have some thoughts on that. And so for me, I think it's important. You know, you can think about this work. You know, the, the sustainable development goals. You can think about this, the 17 sustainable development goals, and you can say, okay, goal number 16 is peace and justice around peace and justice. You can say that's. You know, that's one of 17 good goals out there, along with the climate and poverty, disease and education ones, etc. Even if you think of it that way, I would submit to you, it's got to be point number one. It is the most critically important. Because if you don't have stable societies, all the other development indicators go to zero. And if you have really violent societies, if you have Syria happen, you know, all of those indicators go to zero for an entire generation or more because of the trauma, the displacement, the infrastructure destruction, so if you care about education, women's empowerment, you care about climate change, you care about any other issues, issue number one is how to be to stabilize societies. But again, much more profound, and I think much more important, is not thinking about conflict transformation and peace building just in that way. It's actually understanding that the only way we're going to get progress on all of those issues is if we're able to generate a kind of cooperation uh, that we're not used to that we're not used to having. That's not been our default. So how are we going to do that? There are three steps, I think, to doing that that, that I think are, are truly important. Uh, my apologies because I'm having some technical challenges. Um, and these are things that anybody can do. And I, I raise them again because this is, this, these are the dynamics in conflict that quite genuinely play out whether you know, your mother and her sister, your aunt, are uh, at, at each other's throats, or you're trying to facilitate better understanding and relations between the United States and Iran. Um, um, so the first thing uh, is listening. It's a very basic one. But listening in order to understand, not listening to convince, is the first step in any successful conflict transformation process, any kind of peace building process. We facilitate uh, one of our programs. We use virtual exchange programming. Uh, we really one of the we were one of the, the leaders and pioneers of this field. It's basically it takes interactive media technologies and it uses them to connect young people across dividing lines for facilitated dialogue and education. We've integrated this program into over 100 universities and colleges around the world, and we focus on uh, about half from the young people from the half of them coming from the U.S. In Western Europe, and the other half coming from Muslim majority countries, because these are some of the more profound dividing lines and misunderstandings that we have across that divide. And we put them together in this small video conferencing platform, no more than 10 of them, always with a highly trained facilitator, and they meet every week in two hour sessions for eight weeks. And we've now got this program, and we've done 26 iterations of this. We do it twice a year over the academic semesters now for 13 years. And we have a, a wonderful neuroscience uh, team that uh, partners with us to gauge the impact on young people's cross-cultural empathy and cross-cultural collaboration and communication skills. And what they found is something that every one of our facilitators, and I bet you most of the mediators who are in this room, could have told you without having to get it reified by neuroscientists. And that is that the critical threshold, the critical threshold for someone to pass through in order to be more open to collaborating and communicating across difference is not being agreed with by the other side. That's actually irrelevant. The critical threshold to go through is having the experience of being heard and respected. 
especially when you don't think you're going to be, especially when you're entering into a situation where you think you're going to be at odds with this person. And we see this in this program all the time, where every semester, some of the students will say, once they trust the space enough to really open up, someone will say, I don't think terrorism or extremism is a fringe phenomenon in your society. I think your religion is violent. Or someone else will say, I don't think the September 11th attacks really happened the way that they've been talked about. I think your government and Israel organized them. These are, these are very mainstream groups, <coughs> actually, across these societies. Uh, and I would submit to you that they're, they're, for me anyway, where I sit, they're equally shocking. If you're substantially more shocked by one of them than the other one, you know, it's good to reflect on this. But in the room, what, what I can tell you hardly ever happens is these views don't get surfaced across these dividing lines. They don't get surfaced and talked about across these dividing lines. And what we found is when a young person says something like that, and the response is, I completely disagree with you. I'm in fact a little offended by what you just said, but I really want to understand where you're coming from. You know, have you had personal experiences that led you to feel this way? You know, is there something in particular that you're angry about or scared of, or hopeful of? You know, and when they have that reaction, rather than being shut down, from that point forward, every single time, the discussion goes to a different place. For the rest of that group's existence together, they have a different level of conversation. They ask each other more questions. They're more willing to acknowledge that maybe their own communities have something to do with the negative dynamic they're growing. They're more open to self-criticism. Uh, but the key threshold is being heard and respected. And so that's why it's really critical at the beginning of any process to begin by listening and asking questions. And this is where Marilyn Manson comes in. So I don't know if you ever saw the film um, uh, Bowling for Columbine. It's a Michael Moore film where he's trying to figure out the answer to the question, why do we have so much gun violence in the US? Because there are just as many guns per capita in a country like Switzerland or Canada, big hunting societies or where it's more of the tradition, but we have way more gun deaths per capita. So he's asking all these people, smart people, these questions. And I thought by far the most profound statement in the entire film came from Marilyn Manson, who spends his time on the stage more than half naked and with makeup on his face. And Mar why Marilyn Manson? Because Dylan Thiebold and, and, the, and his friend who shot up the school at Columbine High School uh, were big Marilyn Manson fans. And so one of the things that came out after that horrible event was some people saying, it's the music, it's the music, we should you know, uh, boycott Marilyn Manson's violent lyrics and all this kind of stuff. So Michael Moore was sitting with Marilyn Manson and he asked him the question. He said, if you could talk to those boys and <coughs> that, they, that they killed their, their peers and teachers at the school, what would you say? And Marilyn Manson didn't hesitate for a second. He immediately responded, I wouldn't say anything. I've listened to them. That's what nobody did. And that was, that's somebody who truly understands the kind of alienation and angst that young people feel. And that is one of the best answers I've ever seen. And we see this when we're dealing with Government leaders who are autocratic and violent in their behavior, but at the end of the day, oftentimes are so isolated and actually so terrified that nobody will, will listen to them or have an open conversation with them. We see that with people convicted of terrorism. We work in the prison systems in Morocco. We're the only international organization allowed to work in the prisons there. We, we train all the prison directors. We work with all the prison guards, many of the prison guards and, and prisoners. Similarly, in Indonesia and Kyrgyzstan. And listening is issue number one in terms of opening up the possibility for transformation. It's not the certainty for sure, but the possibility. So, listening is a critical starting point. Listening also helps you to frame things. If you want to get two people to a table, you need to frame things in a way that they both feel like they're welcome to that conversation. It's kind of difficult to get people to have a conversation uh, uh, if, if it's teed up uh, as, you know, how can, we, uh, how can we ensure that abortion will stay legal? You're not going to get a diverse array of people. To that, to that room. So it helps you to frame things. And the reason why framing is important is because of the second, the second thing we can all do that I want to raise. And that is to try to generate cooperation, not just dialogue, but cooperation across the body lines. Cooperation on anything, literally anything. One of the things that I think our organization has demonstrated in our field, and the contribution I think we've made to our field, because the field is quite populated now, is we do do some traditional conflict resolution. We do mediation, and we do facilitated dialogue pretty much everywhere. But we also produce hundreds of hours of reality television and soap operas. We do a lot of community theater. We use a lot of arts. We use a lot of sports. We use whatever will bring divided societies together. And the more traumatized uh, and polarized and fearful societies are, when the, the more seemingly innocuous or silly the shared activity might be. But you have to start somewhere. 
And that's why we have this motto, understand your differences, act on your commonalities. That's not forget the differences. It's not paper them over, pretend that they're not there, because the differences will hit you over the head all the time. They're all around, they're constantly there. But you start where you can begin cooperation. Why is cooperation important? This goes back to the point I was making about the importance of emotion. Okay? If you're trying to bridge dividing lines, if you're trying to build relationships across dividing lines, fact-based discourse and exchange hardly ever works. It almost always deteriorates into argumentation. Um, what's critically important is to enable people to have the emotional experience of connecting with somebody with whom they might not agree on many things at all. Um, why is that important? Uh, people's worldviews, their behaviors, are much more formed by their emotional experiences than by rational argumentation. We will rationalize why we think this, that, and the other thing, oftentimes, comforts us. But the reality is what really forms people's views and initiates their behavior is emotional experience. The experience of being persistently humiliated, alienated, ignored, or the corollary experience of being constantly um, listened to, respected, and honored will have a much bigger impact on how you behave in society than any facts about you know, the, 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 any other communities or any other issues. My wife is, a, uh, is, a, is an academic. Uh, she's a scholar and she's, she's studying our, our fields are, are intersecting uh, the more that we, we are together. Um, and she's done a lot of research. She has a book that's about to come out um, uh, about the rise of the radical right in Germany, in particular, um, how uh, it's been marketing itself as in a, in a more mainstream way. And the name of the book that will come out, I'm promoting it for her, is The, uh, the Extreme Non Mainstream. And uh, one of the troubling things about it is when it was first, when she first submitted actually the manuscript, it was Extreme Non Mainstream? question mark, Because this was like three years ago. And the only thing the publisher said, uh, when she came back now with the, the latest manuscript was the first, you know, like, get this thing done, it needs to get out, because this sounds, everyone wants to see this. And second, take the question mark off. Um, so, but I say that because in her research, one of the things that she did is she would um, observe classes in Germany where expressing national pride has been a taboo ever since the Second World War. You can understand. The strong expressions of national pride have such a close you know, connection with the Nazi era, that there's a lot of discomfort with waving the German flag or talking about how proud you are to be German. And yet young people keep growing up generation after generation, going to football matches or soccer matches and seeing France and England and everyone else expressing all kind of joy and, and pride, and yet uh, literally the expression of national pride in Germany has been a taboo. It's been a marker of extremist attitudes. There have been debates, presidential candidates have debated whether they're proud to be German or not. This has been a big issue. And the radical right has really exploited this. Come to this concert where we sing about how proud we are to be German. Come here, wear this shirt, do these things where you can be proud of who you are, right? Um, so in these classrooms, these teachers she would watch who were teaching these kids and are trying to you know, deal with the, the, the rise in, in xenophobia uh, and anti-immigrant sentiment would say facts. Like, hey, did you realize how much a proportion of the, na the national safety net is contributed by immigrants and the children of immigrants. It's a huge proportion and it's getting bigger. They're a vital part of the society. And then my wife would go and interview the kids right outside the classroom one by one and the ones who were immigrants or who were uh, welcoming and friendly with immigrants would say, absolutely, that's right. And the ones who were already in the right wing scene or attracted to it would say, look at this. We're becoming a smaller and smaller proportion of the population. Pretty soon we're going to be on uh, uh, reservations, like those Native Americans. They, usually, they actually use that as an example. Same exact fact. And we see this everywhere. If you, if you put a fact in front of two people who believe opposite worldviews, they will immediately, immediately interpret that fact in a way that reinforces what they already believe. And it's really extraordinary. And so it doesn't mean that facts are not important. Facts are important, and there's an important place for them. But when you're trying to build relationships, it's vitally important that you're able to build the relationships across those dividing lines and help people understand why they believe what they believe, what is it that they want, what are their hopes, what are their fears. So I want to show you a couple of examples, and I'll wrap up with these, uh, to give you a sense of what are the kinds of dividing lines that you can bridge in this way. And I would submit to you that you can bridge pretty much any dividing lines in this way. When we're doing, uh, when you look at societies in conflict, you oftentimes look at, there are a lot of different ways you can sort of analyze them. One way you can look at them is you can look at horizontal cohesion and vertical cohesion, which is just a fancy way of saying, how are people getting along, and how are people in their governance getting along, right? 
So horizontal cohesion, what are relationships like across political parties and influence between races, between ethnicities, between religious communities, whatever it might be? Uh, are people participating in joint, um, uh, are there joint ventures and businesses that bring these people together? Are there public spaces where they mix all the time? Are the schools integrated? Are there, you know, all these kinds of questions, and you kind of look at what the state of horizontal cohesion is in societies. Um, so I want to show you just a quick example, and we'll talk much about it, um, of how we foster, we seek to foster horizontal cohesion. Thank 
when we hear these stories, they said, oh, I also said X, Y, Z. And many families came out and said, oh, if my family is still alive, it's because of her. She has hidden my family for six months. And then those who were perceived as traitors became heroes because everybody was proud. We organized a national summit of heroes and invited the government and the opposition and everyone who said, even the president himself said, oh, finally we have people to rely on. We didn't know these people existed because we had them in the ocean. Okay, we have some problems, but we also people who are human, people who care about human lives. And this is something that we need to show and show that within communities we have people who do well, people who deserve this kind of respect. So, you know, just to put a fine point on you want to hear me speaking. You know the fact that I'm wearing the same suit, by the way. Ah, okay. I'm a non-profit leader. I have like two suits. <laughs> um, um, so what he didn't finish with there, what I added there, and I'll add for you now, is if you go to Burnley today, the word in Kingby, which used to just mean pillar, the pillar of a building, now means a hero of patriotic solidarity. It means a, it's, it's, it's a hero, it's a term for, for, for a hero. Um, and, and that's the second way that you can actually achieve scale, is shifting social norms. And media can be quite a powerful way to help influence social norms. Uh, when they did that festival, and I'll never forget, because I was there at that time, and when they did this festival, and they had on the stage everything from, from, from colonels to farmers to business leaders to everything on that stage, all being celebrated in this way. It was like a turning point for the country. If you look at Burundi today, you have a political crisis, and you have serious tensions, and you have violence that's broken out. You do not have anything like the tinge of ethnic identity-based conflict, which is a whole other category. This is a political crisis, and it's serious and dangerous enough, but the solidarity, the solidarity has held, at least so far, on the, on the, uh, in terms of ethnicity, and that's critically important. Um, I won't show you the last video, because I don't want to take any more time. I will just tell you, because uh, I want to give you one more example um, of the kind of conflict that we can address this way, and I think I've closed with one of many people on this, so my apologies. Um, it's not just relations between people. It's also relations between people and governments. Uh, we do a lot of work right now between police forces or military and, and local populations. Uh, several years ago in Nepal, uh, a peer organization of ours ran a survey of youth attitudes towards the police. Uh, there had been a lot of violence between the youth and the police. And the youth had been rioting and throwing rocks, and the police were coming in very heavy-handed. Uh, and they issued the results of this survey, which not surprisingly enough, sort of said, we hate the police. Um, and this was very embarrassing to the police. They didn't really want to work with any of the organizations that had anything to do with that survey. So our leader there, uh, uh, who himself had come from this, the, the youth leadership, he'd been one of the leaders of the major youth movements in Nepal, went to the police chief of Kathmandu and said, we'd like to do a survey as well, but we, we want it to be helpful to you. So two things. First, we'll, we want to co-create it with you. We want to ask questions that will be helpful to you in finding out are there ways we can improve relations? And then we won't re release the results unless you're comfortable with us doing that. So on that basis, the police said, OK, to do that. Uh, and they only asked to add two questions to the survey that our team had developed. One was a question around, you know, what kind of resources do you think the police actually have? Because one of the things they were struggling with, as police in many places struggle with, is the assumption by communities that they have all kinds of capacities and all kinds of means and resources when, in a lot of countries, they just don't, and things are being expected of them that are almost humanly impossible. The other question, it's kind of a sweet question, which was, was there anything that you would thank the police for? Uh, and, you know, the vast majority of people said no, but there are still those who said yes, which formed the basis for the beginning of uh, some work that we began doing together. That led to soccer tournaments that we did between the police and young people. Those soccer tournaments led to discussions about how relations could be improved in a more durable basis. The police chief eventually came to our team, this is after a couple of years of this work now, and said, will you work with us to roll out this sort of community policing across Kathmandu? Uh, and we just finished broadcasting the first season of a reality television show in Nepal uh, around community policing, where young people are trying to become part of the police academy in order to move on to the next episode, they have to demonstrate the skills of a good community police officer. You come across a dispute in the marketplace, what do you do? Do you heighten tensions or can you diffuse them? And this really started to, it's deepened the collaboration between police and youth around collaborative approaches to security and peace building. Our single largest project in the world 
is in Democratic Republic of Congo. We're now providing training to nearly 70% of the Congolese military along a similar basis. And that's who started with the community theater performance in one district. Uh, so this can work in shifting relations between institutions and the populations. It can work in trying to shift relationships between populations themselves. And that brings me to the last, the third and last point of what we can do, and also to the Shawshank Redemption, um, which is, I, so I, um, uh, I like that movie. You've probably seen it, because even if you don't like it, it's one of those films that's on like, every week for some reason. Um, and at one point, uh, Tim Robbins' character and Morgan Freeman's character, Tim Robbins is just come out of solitary confinement forever, and he's sitting there, and he starts talking about how, when I get out, I'm going to go to Mexico, and I'm going to start this you know, thing, I'm going to get my own boat, and we're going to, and, and, and finally Morgan Freeman's character just steps in and says, I just, I can't see you doing this to yourself anymore. Just give it up. Just stop. You're going to kill yourself, you know, with these pipe dreams. And Robin's character says the best line in the movie for me, which is, well, I guess we all have a choice. You either get busy living or you get busy dying. And I do have to say, one of the things in this work that we see a lot, and the reason that I started by asking you sort of how hopeful you are, how, how successful do you think we're being dealing with conflict, uh, it really is true that when you go into any Senate, whether it's the relationship between Trump supporters and Sanders or Clinton supporters here, or on gun control, or between US and Iran, or whatever, when you go in looking for how bad things are, you will, it, was, it takes a superhuman effort for you to come out of that kind of an approach, anything other than cynical. And let alone fearful to engage in it at all. Uh, when you go in saying, I'm going to just ask some questions, I'm assuming that I'll find some hope there somewhere by just asking some questions, I can promise you, literally a hundred times out of a hundred, that approach will bring up to you nodes of hope all over the place. There's an approach that I, I read in Harvard Business Review once that had nothing to do with peace building. That was actually the best explanation of the approach to assessments that we do at the outset of the work. Uh, it's this whole field that some of you might know called appreciative inquiry. And it basically says, when you're trying to transform an organizational culture, you're trying to shift something that's ingrained, what do you do? Do you catalog everything that's going wrong and figure out how are we going to solve those problems? Or do you celebrate each incremental step towards the desired behavior? No matter how small that step is, you're going to encourage it and incentivize it and celebrate it. And uh, all social change research will show you that that's the approach. Celebrating every step, even if it's a silly soccer match in the middle of people who've been killing each other for 50 years, celebrating and fanning the flames of that little positive step. Because that's what ultimately gets you to really society, big time societal change, even institutional change. And the only way you can get that is entering and choosing to hope. Not being naive, which is very different but choosing to be hopeful. Uh, I think if we do that across whatever the dividing lines you care about, we'll be able to create a much safer and more just world. So thank you very much for your time. everybody in the room thinking, how do we get that voice and your voice on CNN, Fox News, NBC, Meet the Press, Face the Nation, how do we get that voice more expressed around the world of media so we can start building these kind of bases? What's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong with our picture over not getting that? Two questions, but really one. No, thank you. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, thank you. That's a, uh, you're going to boost my ego. Uh, I'll have to get some more suits for that. But I think two things. I think one is coming from the media, and the other, frankly, is coming from our field. You know, from the media, there there is oftentimes a lot of pressure on media outlets, uh, uh, or they choose it, whatever. Or they, maybe you don't want to let them off the hook to really fan the flames. Because it makes for good TV, or it makes for good radio, or you get more viewers, or you get more followers if you really kind of heighten the, the, the conflict. Uh, and you get people kind of going at each other rather than identifying areas where they might agree. So that comes from the media side of things. And the times when you see exceptions to that are when things go horribly wrong. When there's a massacre at Newton School, or there's some other horrible event, you might get a really moving town hall meeting where they actually bring together people across the dividing lines to try to have a civilized conversation about what can we do here. And sometimes those are really powerful. But peace building is not an event, it's a process, right? It's not a one-time thing. We have to be keeping out of it. So one part of it, I think, is coming from the media. The other is coming from our own field. And this is something that I personally, in our organization, is committed to really tackling in a very serious way. I am hoping you're going to be seeing a lot more of me. Not because I, I, I have a healthy ego, but I don't, you know, we have been much too reticent as a field 
to claim success from anything. I think that's partially because it's difficult to measure success realistically in the peace building world. Um, if we hadn't done this, this bad thing would have happened. That can be tough to measure. It's a lot harder to measure than we distributed 18,000 dead deaths in an area that went down this amount. Uh, so it's a difficult thing to measure. But it's also been because of the nature of peace building, and the mediators here will probably say the same thing, is to put yourself in the background world. And that comes from the most important instinct. The parties of the conflict themselves have to feel like they solved it. And that's great. But I do think that today and going forward, we need a much more aggressive and assertive voice for peace building to share examples that it works, and also, frankly, to challenge the notion that adversarial approaches represent strength and collaborative approaches represent weakness, because the exact opposite is actually true. <coughs> and in this interconnected world, it's not only that collaborative approaches represent a stronger way forward, they are the only approaches that are going to generate enduring change. You know, I, I, when I was, you know, the, the, the night before I got to do that panel, it was the, the school forum, I, I got a chance to meet the rock star Bono. And I was excited to meet him because I love his music, but I was really excited to meet him because um, if you ever had you ever read this story about how Bono uh, activated around the issue of debt relief for Africa with the uh, arch conservative senator from North Carolina who passed away, Jesse Helms. Uh, it's one of the best examples of common ground or collaborative activism uh, that you'll ever see, certainly from a celebrity. It just not because celebrities are shallow, but because they're busy and they oftentimes go for the fast win. Bono spent hours in private with Helms. He refused to embarrass him or pressure him publicly. He took heat from his own guitarist and his friends uh, for, uh, spending this, for spending this much time with this guy, for humanizing this guy, who represented a lot of things that people on the political left thought were important. Um, he uh, asked him a lot of questions. He found out how important uh, Christian values were to him. They talked about the Bible. They connected at a level of values and interests. At one point, uh, Jesse Helms broke down time. Uh, Helms went to a concert of Bono's in the, in the, in the backstage to watch a concert. It was amazed at the fact that it, he's on record saying Bono sways his hips and the whole audience sways their hips. It's crazy. Um, but at the end of all that, they formed a relationship enough where they could really talk about how do we live out our values and what's going on today. And when Helms switched and became a lead champion for debt relief in Africa, that whole issue switched. It wasn't that one party beat the other party and got that passed. And then four years later, or two years later, the other party came back again. Some of the most enduring change between Republicans and Democrats in our increasingly polarized society here in the States has been on PEPFAR, debt relief for Africa, and some of these other things, where there's been a value basis established for it that conservatives and liberals alike have really coalesced around. And I don't want to give Bono all the credit for debt relief, but I think entering that way, trying to understand people's values, assuming that they're not evil, that they might have good reasons for what they want, but we might be able to find meaningful common ground, is a really powerful way to go. So we should be telling those stories, we should be celebrating those people, and we should also be challenging the notion uh, that these adversarial approaches somehow represent a stronger path forward for us. Hi, I just want to say this is the most uh, empowering and inspiring talk I've heard. That is not TED Talks. So we need to get you on TED Talks, and I'm not kidding about that, it would be great. I have two comments and a question. First, uh, you're right about the media and why the commercial media in this country isn't interested in this kind of thing, because conflict sells, and there is no drama without conflict. I used to work in the media, I worked for one of the major networks, and believe me, I was part of that sausage factory. And so I'm still doing that and mea culpa about that, but you know, we would pit people against each other because it would boost ratings and it would make for better programming. So that's, you were right on your instincts on that. The other thing, conflict resolution came home to me when I didn't speak to my own brother, my own surviving family member for three years. And this is kind of a gr great thing about global conflict resolution, that sometimes conflict is right next to you in your own family. And that took a lot of back and forth letter writing, similar to what the US and the Soviets did during the Cold War, and then we finally had our face-to-face -face Reykjavik talk, so we're not talking. So here's the question. Um, are you and other fellow peacemakers a little bit concerned that the old order of the post-war Cold War consensus is breaking down because you saw Brexit and you saw the election of Donald Trump? Do you fear any of that having an effect on your ability and other peacemakers' abilities to make peace? Yeah, that's a great question. So. Uh, uh, we, we see things in, a, in different directions. We definitely see that pulling away from the very sort of the globalist structures, whether it's the EU or the UN, uh, the erecting of walls, 
figuratively or literally. Um, um, we also see pulling in the other direction. Um, the, the challenge right now is that there's not really the option uh, to become less interconnected. Walls will not make us more impervious to the effects of climate change if certain countries don't get up. And this is not even a this is not even like a political statement about climate change. If you go to the countries where we work and you look at what some you know fueling conflicts across the Sahel region right now, increased droughts. Pushing people with their herds to have to get further and further into the farmers' territory. The farmers, you know, killing some of the cows or killing the herders. The herders are striking back. Herders happen to be mostly Muslim. Farmers happen to be mostly Christian, as well as different ethnic and tribal groups. And this is really this is this is affecting much of, of the sub-Saharan African continent. Um, so climate change. These are the, uh, uh, all of the kinds of factors. The fact that it, you know I don't want to overstate this especially with the successful businessman in the room, this might be overstated, but you know, a day trader 6,000 miles away can do something that might melt down the whole global economy if we don't have the right structures for regulating financial trade. Like, that world is now here, and it's only becoming more interconnected. And so the response to that is, on the one hand, a lot of fear. And can we just pull back and, and be more secure somehow uh, on our own? It's also spurring the opposite reaction, which is we got to make sure that we're doing this cooperation better. As much as I love the UN and the EU, they're also huge. You won't talk to a person who loves those organizations who won't acknowledge this is deeply flawed for all kinds of reasons. Um, and so, we and one of the big challenges I think we're facing. If I say to you, okay, most of the issues now can only be solved if we're able to generate cooperation across a lot more parties. So we need some sort of platforms and institutions that would enable that dialogue and problem solving across larger and larger groups of people or institutions, etc. Well, the larger these institutions get, the more detached they end up feeling and the more alien they end up feeling to individual people. And this is what you heard from a lot of people who voted for Brexit. This is what you heard from a lot of Americans who voted for Trump. I don't want to simplify why people voted, but you would hear people saying, there's this, we have close supporters in the UK who at one point confided in me that they supported, they were big boosters of, of Brexit. So I had a conversation with them and they said, at the end of the day, there are these people sitting in Brussels who we never elected who are making decisions that are directly affecting our future. It's not at all transparent. We have no input into them. And we said enough. And you would hear that here in the States too, where there's this federal government that's getting larger and larger and larger. There's a presidency that's becoming more and more empowered, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, I would say, in office. Uh, and, and we're feeling, you know, and, and so um, uh, that's a fundamental challenge. And so to answer your question, um, I think the deeper thing that's going on is that sea change of interconnectivity. And yes, it is kicking up one reaction, which is let's all just put up walls and go back to an era when maybe we weren't so interconnected. Uh, that it doesn't, that's not going to work out, not for political reasons, just the reality. And so it's also kicking up a lot of these questions. It's what got uh, the, that National Security Advisor saying to us, I need some more buttons to push. Uh, it's what got, and we, we've had, we had the, you know, we have a, a partnership with a gold mining company in East Africa. We've been working with them in this country for, <coughs> in year to year, like between them and the local communities, they have mine sites in this, in this country. And at one point, this was about a year and a half ago, they asked to extend the agreement for a few years. It was the first time they asked for a multi-year partnership with us. So I flew to London to meet the CEO and say, you know, this is great, but why? You know, it's, you know, I'm just kind of curious why this is. And he said, you know, we did an assessment, and our use of ammunition, and this is mostly uh, non-lethal ammunition, like uh, 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 crowd dispersal stuff, tear gas, uh, bean bags, whatever. Our use of ammunition at our mine sites is down 98%. And our overall security budget has gone down 60%, from 46 million a year to 19 million a year, almost 60%. Over the same time, actual security results have gone way up. We've had no riots at the mine sites, no deaths at the mine sites. The relations with the community is getting better. It's not perfect, but it's getting better. And we see a big part of the reason for that is the work that we're doing with you and with the local community and the government. Um, so what we're seeing is the leaders really challenged with how do I deal with the fact that I can't, we're interconnected, I can't secure my 50-year investment by just agreeing with the relatively corrupt government on how we're going to share the wealth. I gotta have relationships with the local communities and I've gotta be in good relationship with them. And we're seeing that in the national security people. So, so it's, the, both things are going on at the same time. 
And um, it is tough for, you know, we, I don't know if it was Nietzsche or somebody said, don't, don't tear something down until you've got something at least of equal value put in this place, and then you credit the wrong person. Um, doesn't sound like it, actually. <laughs> um, but, but that's a little scary. That part is a little scary to, to me, because uh, it's one thing to say these things aren't working. It's another thing to say we don't need anything like that anymore. Because that that's not true, that we don't need these platforms for cooperation and dialogue. Uh, the other thing that is scary to me is we don't have a great track record of making you know, breakthroughs until we have breakdowns, you know? Uh, people decide to do things fundamentally different when things break down. Well, we can't really afford to break down on some of these issues. We can't afford to break down on nuclear non-proliferation or climate change. Some people would say we've already got the breakdown, we're already past midnight on that issue. Uh, so those are the things that worry me more is, you know, that will we be able to generate the political will and the systems to do this with one another uh, before we have a major breakdown, before we tear down a system that actually as flawed as it was, is really necessary. I had the opposite reaction uh, to my neighbor on the right here. Uh, I thought the radio program this morning was just incredible, and I was coming here expecting to see to learn a lot more, but I, I don't understand what you're talking about, really. And I disagree, for starters, with your premise that the killing has gone down. The United States has killed between 20 and 30 million people since World War II. And, uh, and uh, there, you know, there were fewer years between World War I and World War II. But I wonder if, if, say, it was a third of the time, let's say, um, <coughs> A third, seven million people, or seven million people killed in the world during that time. Uh, that's one thing. So I, I have trouble at the, the initial uh, instance. Maybe it's my hearing, but I'm just not understanding what you're saying. And I'd like to make a request. Uh, I know that uh, Mr. Saltman did a, a, a non-fact-based program in uh, Israel uh, playing basketball. And I'm wondering if he could share what the results of that were and have you analyze, well, what, explain how, what the reason for those results were. I'd really like to understand what you're saying. Sure. Actually, when I was watching the Lebanese-Syrian film, I wonder what it would be like to interject Israeli kids, Israeli kids into that film of the same age. Because the conversation between the Syrian and the Lebanese kids were very similar to the conversation between the Palestinian and Jewish kids, the Muslim, Christian, Arabs, and the Israeli kids at 8, 17, 18, 16, 17 years old playing basketball. Uh, I thought the experience was um, meaningful but short lived, which is really distressing to me because these kids started off not, not wanting to be with each other. You got Palestinians and you got Jews that live five and ten kilometers apart from each other. They're all interested in sports. They're all very, most of them are very good basketball players. In fact, the film is so much like your film, the little segment you showed that I was kind of thinking it was almost like the same film, had the same tonal quality even. <clears throat> I spoke English, I don't speak any Hebrew or Arabic, so it was a little bit of a, a, little bit of a compromise for me, but I did it in spite of that, but I had these really terrific Arab and Jewish coaches that were there kind of coaching each side, really very open to helping these kids kind of communicate with each other. Probably the single most important person in the whole, besides the film, but in the whole enterprise that I was doing, was an Israeli Druze, major in the Israeli army. The Druze are in Lebanon, Syria, Israel, they're all over. It depends where they are, which country they identify with, they identify with that country. So this particular guy, Hamed, was terrific, and he really brought these kids together along with an Arab, football player named Abba Swan. Abba Swan is one of the only Arab kids to play on, now an adult, on the Israeli national football team. Um, that was also really impressive. Common ground. And I was searching for common ground. Did it go beyond that? I did two programs like that. Basically, the recession hit. I didn't do any more of them after that. I probably should have. But the film's been on television a lot in Israel. Seen it, they know that this concept's out there, and I'm not the only one. There are all kinds of programs that bring Arabs and Palestinians together. So I'm not quite sure what the answer to the question is, but I want Shamil to tell me and us how that's going to happen in Israel because I think your approach is truly brilliant, bringing people together with these little small steps. And can that happen in Israel? And can we find a 
peace process that's applicable to this conversation we're having in Israel? Yeah. That's a much easier question, how to solve the israeli palestinian conflict. Um, no, that's great that you did that, first of all. When was this, can I ask? When did you do the soccer? The uh, basketball? 07, 06, 07. Okay. Um, well, I would say, you know, in terms of what, what, you, what he supported and you were asking about, to me, it's, it's an exact example of where you're trying to find any terrain on which you can bring together people who otherwise don't want to come together. Um, what we try to do is to stay engaged for the long term because especially when things are that divided you need to build on that cooperation some other kind of cooperation you know and, and oftentimes in really divided societies where there's been a lot of violence or a lot of trauma uh, it's going to take years of different kinds of cooperation for them perhaps to, to, to actually begin talking about and maybe even cooperating on some of the core issues in the conflict, some of the things that are really driving the conflict uh, between them. And, and that's difficult. <coughs> Part of the things with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is uh, fatigue that people have, even those who have been trying these kinds of efforts, who have been participating in these kinds of efforts and kind of trying to make them happen, have gotten exhausted by the years and years of trying to, to make this happen. Uh, I have to say, um, you know, every project that we run that at some point really shifted into a much bigger thing where a government ministry took it over and made it mainstream or where a television show became so popular that people actually started behaving differently in the marketplace or something like this. They, none of them started with any certainty that we would get there. They all started the way that you did. And, and there's this, you know, we used to, the, Napoleon might not be the best person to quote for a peace building organization, but there's this, apparently he was asked why he was so successful in battle, that he must have planned for every contingency perfectly prepared, and apparently he said something, I don't know if this is apocryphal, but he said, no, 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 on s'engage et puis on voit. You get engaged, you have to get engaged, and only then when you're in the middle of the battle do you see opportunities and you have to grab them when you see them. And peace building is very much the same way. At a certain point, you don't want to be irresponsible, you need to do no harm for you, you don't want to be engaging in a stupid way, but you just, you, you get engaged and then you see what the possibilities are, and sometimes something will trigger to something much broader. And so I guess, this might not be an acceptable answer for a lot of political analysts on that conflict, but just to tell you um, what's, I'll tell you one more story about this to make my point. I have a friend who's a Palestinian professor who's been working on this kind of peace building for his whole life. Co-teaching with an Israeli professor, doing all kinds of exchanges, trying every which way, getting attacked from fellow Palestinians for being a sellout, all that kind of stuff. And after the, the last Gaza war, I saw him and he was totally depressed. And, and he was talking about how, you know what? They're right. They're right. Everything that we've been doing, you know, we're just a failure. You know, it, it, that adds up to nothing. And it really just struck me because I'm thinking, you're looking at a conflict to which, and I don't know what the exact numbers are, but probably something like 98% of the resources paid to that conflict have gone to an adversarial, negate the other side, or bomb the other side, or otherwise occupy that side, whatever it might be. And maybe 2% have gone to basketball efforts and negotiation efforts or whatever. And then when everything falls apart, we point at the 2% peace builders and say, oh, you guys are really failing. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. And this is some of the stuff that I think we need to be much more aggressively challenging. So I don't mean to, don't mean to offend with the, the, what the, I was citing about, you know, the, the, the amount of, of, of violence and war. I would encourage you to look at some of what, um, like the, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute or the Oslo Peace Research Institute, some of the institutes that really have been for decades tracking different trends in violent conflict, just some of what they put out. It, it is very telling. It also shows not only changes in, in the amount of victims, but also changes in the, in the nature and kind of conflict. It is an interesting resource. But on your question and concern what you've done, to me, the question might not necessarily be, well, you've got to do that a lot smarter. So we need a lot more people doing this and staying in the game to do it over the long term and not giving up. Good. One last question. Yeah, question. Thank you. I really enjoyed your, uh, your speech earlier, so thank you for that. Uh, my question is, uh, as a young person, uh, I'm feeling nowadays more and more disconnected from uh, our government, so not only the government is like different, but their viewpoint is promoting conflict and creating bias <coughs> against uh, 
other communities. So is there any suggestion you have for the young people to feel more connected to this particular type of government who's holding the opposite viewpoint? Yeah, well, one of, your, one, of your, uh, one of the alums of this institution who's sitting right here uh, came up with a genius idea. It's one of the things we're most excited about, actually. It's a, it's a, it's a social pervasive game. I've got the demo app on my phone called Battle for Humanity. That is a, 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 a gamified way for young people to accept and create missions for peace building within their own communities and across the dividing lines between the communities and the governments and between the communities and one another. It's fantastic. I'd love to show it to you. But just to say, the reason that I'm so excited about that um, uh, is because we, we do anticipate at some point in the next 10 to 20 years that we'll see an unprecedentedly powerful youth driven peace building movement. Uh, because these movements tend to come in reaction to wars. And they and they so they, they tend to come out of in individual countries that have gone to war. You have these peace building movements come up, uh, and usually adults get the Nobel prizes, but youth on college campuses and elsewhere are oftentimes been the instigators uh, of this kind of thing, the motivators. Um, uh, and we've never had something like that sparked in an interconnected world, where young people in particular as, are as connected across dividing lines in geography as, as as ever before in history. So we're anticipating that that is going to happen. And we want to play some small role in helping to spark it and be accelerated, slightly shape it so that youth aren't just tearing down what doesn't work, but building what will work, which is more collaboration and understanding. As for the government pieces, uh, piece of it, I, you know, some of your professors will have better, <coughs> your political science professors might have better ideas. One thing that I would encourage you to think about is if you can, not get only, not get solely preoccupied by the big figure at the top, Donald Trump or the senators, and start looking at the supporters in your own communities and figure out with them how you can connect with them, build a relationship with them, understand where they're coming from. Is there any way you can find a common cause? Is there any way that you can understand what's driving them? Because these politicians are, you know, Obama said recently, whether you agree with it or not, you know, we all get the politicians we deserve. Um, and whether or not you agree with that, I think what we, we We'll, right now, everyone's sort of getting really riled up in their own bubbles at what's going on up here. And the bubbles are right next to each other, not even talking to one another. I mean, Greg was just telling me today that earlier he took screenshots, back-to-back -back screenshots of the Fox News and CNN website homepages so just so you could show how diametrically, entirely opposed they were covering the exact same issues. And that's how we're sort of living right now. So my encouragement to you, it's not to say don't engage with the political <coughs> leaders, but, uh, but engage with people who are supporting them, especially the ones who disagree with you. I hope you might be able to do that um, and see if you might be able to start something together that would be more powerful. Yes? This is, this is more of a comment, not a question. It's more of a comment, not a question. And I'm completely a glass half empty kind of person, but to kind of combine your comment and, and your comment, Mr. Salzman, is, uh, Salzman, is to say that even though things are very depressing and very dark place right now, I still have more hope than I ever have had before because of people like you who are reaching out. And if you even listen to CNBC and, 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 and the business analysts, kids today, the 20-year-olds 20, 20 now, they're not watching CNN and, and Fox. and They're out there doing stuff. They're, they're not waiting to be told what to do. The, the, the youth that today that's making money are more philanthropic than their parents' generations. So I see a lot of reaching out with organizations like you know, with what you're doing. And uh, that gives me a lot of hope for the future. I would also say, you know, engaging politically at the local level could make a real difference. Um, we don't see enough of that. People are so preoccupied by what's going on in Washington. Um, and yet you've got you know, your representatives right here in your own community to say people oftentimes don't even know who they are. Um, and at some point, that you know, big political shifts tend to happen when they're started at the base and built over time, uh, not just focus on the big wins. So. Great note to end on. Thank you for joining us.